Hey everyone, hope you're having a great Thursday. We're gonna do our compilation video here um, talking about polycystic ovarian syndrome. You know, I'll um, put together kind of the stories I did on Instagram this last week and save those for a little bit, um, but obviously this will kind of tie everything together. So uh, PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome has gone through a lot of different kind of names and it's uh, time as a condition. It was originally described by two uh, physicians, Dr. Stein and Leventhal, um, basically when they were looking at women who had difficulty with conception and when they did surgery on them they noticed that their ovaries were very enlarged and had multiple cysts. The original treatment for PCOS was doing what was called an ovarian wedge resection where they would actually cut out a big portion of the ovary and the thought that that would kind of decrease the number of immature follicles and then allow women to ovulate and therefore conceive and there's some truth to that <coughs> excuse me but that's definitely a little bit more barbaric than what we do now. So um, in terms of diagnosis for PCOS, uh, that's once again kind of gone through a lot of different iterations as well. Um, you know, back in the uh, 1990s, you had, you know, a bunch of different kind of lab ratios and things like that you had to put together. In 2003, um, the Rotterdam criteria came out, which basically said you needed two out of three um, of, of these kind of categories to be diagnosed. And then a little, a few years later, um, basically the Hyperandrogenism Society kind of released their own um, kind of statement on things, basically saying, um, you know, we need to do a, uh, you have to have a combination of anovulatory bleeding or oligoovulatory bleeding, so ovulation dysfunction, and then signs of hyperandrogenism, whether that's clinically um, or with, you know, serum blood work. Um, you know, they really took out the presence of the multiple cysts on the ovaries, so it's funny that you can have a condition called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and you don't even have to have cysts on your ovaries to have that. So anyway, that's just a little bit of a, you know, amusing thing to me. So anyway, now, in terms of statistics, PCOS is probably one of, or is the most common reproductive endocrinopathy here in the United States. Estimated somewhere between 10 and 20% of women will, you know, have a form of it. Um, obviously, those numbers may vary depending on where you are. Um, but really, the big thing with it is it can not only affect overall health, um, but it can reduce fertility. Um, and this is where a lot of patients kind of encounter this. They're trying to conceive and they go in and, you know, they're saying, hey, Hey, we've been trying to you know make a baby and nothing's happening what do we do from now and then you know they start kind of an investigation and they figure out oh my gosh we've got PCOS okay well let's treat that so now I am if, if you haven't figured out if you're new to this channel I get very nitpicky and very kind of like bulldoggy with figuring out root causes of things um, and so for me it's always figuring out kind of what is really the the heart of the matter with this patient what are we working on? And so with polycystic ovarian syndrome, another thing that you have to look at is what's going on in terms of insulin resistance. And I talked about this a bunch yesterday in the story, but remember insulin is a hormone that's produced by your pancreas and its main function is to kind of regulate blood sugar. When you eat something, uh, blood sugar kind of gets into your bloodstream. Insulin is in release to basically open the door to cells to allow those cells to take that sugar in so that they can use it for metabolism and whatnot. In patients that don't have enough insulin, that blood sugar stays around and that's called diabetes. Um, now, that's, in, that's type one, that kind of autoimmune type diabetes. Um, now, too high of a blood sugar can cause problems, obviously. Um, but in patients who have insulin resistance, which, you know, goes into kind of type two diabetes, if you will, um, you know, what happens is that, um, that insulin stays around in a high amount, um, because it's not either the patient is not sensitized to it or they're having an inappropriate response. Now, after blood sugar gets put into its, you know, subsequent cells, the remaining insulin says, well, what do we do now? And it starts to affect other types of hormonal functions. In terms of reproductive hormones, the main thing that it does is it causes a decrease in a hormone called sex hormone binding globulin, or SHBG. And SHBG, its main function is to go around and pick up kind of excess or unbound uh, sex hormones like testosterone, estradiol, things like that. And when it's suppressed by that 
extra insulin, what that means then is that those sex hormones are allowed to be in their free kind of unbound form in a higher than normal quality. And that will typically cause symptoms such as, you know, in terms of testosterone, um, facial hair and unwanted or, you know, unwanted facial hair, oily skin, acne, body hair, things like that. In terms of estradiol, what that means is that the lining of the uterus can actually become fluffier or more estrogenized, which can lead to more anovulatory bleeding. Remember that when you look at a normal menstrual cycle, you have to have a rise and fall of estradiol in order to trigger these kind of specific points in the menstrual, menstrual cycle. And if that excess estradiol is floating around, you're not gonna get that rise and fall. You're just gonna kind of get a plateauing effect. And so these patients will never, you know, or with that, you know, they have a very hard time ovulating because there's not the rise to get to, you know, the to cause another hormone called luteinizing hormone to be secreted. Um, and LH um, <coughs> in PCOS patients is already typically higher, you know, kind of floating around than it should be anyway. And it by itself also causes elevated levels of testosterone. So you see, there's this kind of whole mixing here with sex hormones. So um, if a patient has insulin resistance, and that's tested by um, looking at both a fasting insulin, as well as a stressed or what's called a postprandial insulin, typically I use a two hour mark. Um, you know, you have a patient come in, they're fasting, they draw their blood, check the insulin level, then they're given this kind of glucose drink, similar to what you would do for a glucose testing in pregnancy. Um, and they check their blood, you know, two hours later. A fasting insulin higher than 10 is a worrisome value. That kind of says that patient has a lot of underlying disinsulin disinsulinemia. And what that means is that they're at a higher risk for things like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, all those things later on in life. Now, a lot of patients will have totally normal fasting insulins, but when you look at their two hour, that stressed or that postprandial insulin, it will be really high. And for me, that's a level higher than 20. And what that means is that that patient is inappropriately secreting a large amount of insulin and then it's sitting around and not being used after it's, you know, after it, it unlocks the doors to cells so that blood sugar can get in. The other thing to remember with insulin is that it is a stress hormone. It's released in high amounts um, when, you know, our body is stressed. And what that does is it uh, keeps basically fat and calories from really being expended. And the thought behind this kind of goes back to a survival thing. You know, if you had, you know, if you're being chased by bears or you had, you know, the harvest didn't come in or whatever it may be, the people that could hold on to and store that energy were the ones that survived. And so that trait kind of got passed down from generation to generation. But what this means is for patients who have PCOS is that if they have insulin resistance, they may have a much harder time losing weight, um, especially, you know, with kind of normal amounts of diet and exercise. For these patients, it often takes an excessive amount of calorie deprivation or very, very intense exercise to really see a drop in those pounds. And once again, this is, it's, it's not, you know, it, it's a metabolic function. It's in that related to, to that insulin there. So when it comes to treatment for that, there's a bunch of different therapies, everything from, you know, um, supplements such as inositol or N-acetylcysteine. I've had some patients talk about cinnamon. I can't really give you a lot of good data on that, um, but that's kind of in the herbal medicine, kind of nature-suitical literature. I, ha I do know that that's there. Um, inositol works as an insulin sensitizing um, agent, especially it's one of its isomers, um, myo-inositol. And then you have the actual prescription medications. Metformin has been studied probably the most. It's one of the oldest ones, has very awesome gastrointestinal side effects. You can have some pretty gnarly diarrhea with it, especially if you eat sugary things. Um, but other medications such as glyburide or some of the newer drugs such as Wegovy or Ribelsis all work on basically that insulin pathway and those have weight loss associated with them. And when it comes to weight, the other thing to remember with PCOS is that if you do, if you are overweight and you are having menstrual issues, reduction in about 10% of your body weight equates to around a 50% increase in fertility and, you know, more regular cycles. So that's kind of a way we can see if that insulin level is going down without testing it, if patients are starting to have more regular cycles. So I know I went off on a tangent there about insulin, but I think it's really 
important. And it's something that a lot of patients who have PCOS, especially if they're not worried about fertility at this time, struggle with. And so I think it's very necessary to address this and to address it appropriately and not just say, oh, you have PCOS, here's some metformin. Because I mean, what if you don't have insulin resistance? The metformin is not gonna do anything. So you gotta check for that. Now, in terms of other um, kind of things with PCOS, uh, f fertility, for instance, the big issue with that is that there's a lack of ovulation. Remember, there's not that rise and fall of estradiol, so there's not that rise and fall of LH, and therefore the egg does not get released out of the dominant follicle. And so therapies um, in order to induce ovulation are typically ones that are used for patients who have PCOS that are trying to conceive. This can be things like Clomid or Clomiphene citrate. Um, Clomid, Clomid is technically what's called a SERM or a selective estrogen reuptake modulator. It basically goes in and, and makes certain estrogen um, receptors get blocked and others get kind of you know um, agonized or cause them to, to kind of go into overdrive there. Clomid basically makes your body think you're going into menopause and so your brain releases a ton of gonadotropins um, to try and get the ovaries to get stimulated. Um, and in doing so, hopefully that causes ovulation. Um, now for patients with PCOS, we actually see a little bit more improvement in terms of fertility rates in using another medication called letrozole. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor, which means it actually blocks a conversion from testosterone into estrogen. Um, and doing that decreases that estrogen. Once again, kind of tricks your body into thinking you're into menopause. Boom, you have this release of gonadotropins. And then once again, that kind of hopefully uh, ovulation there. Now, fertility drugs aside, um, other things that a lot of times patients who have PCOS struggle with and turn th and include things like um, issues with um, their cervical mucus that can be a little bit thicker or more kind of, you know, um, intense than normal. That's where supplements like N-acetylcysteine can be helpful and kind of help thinning that out. Another thing we see a lot of times, you know, is just sexual function uh, or sexual dysfunction, excuse me. And, you know, this kind of goes back and, and, and looks at how much does sexual desire is affected by body image. A lot of patients feel, you know, if they have this condition and they are showing signs of that increased androgenism, you know, they have the facial hair, they have the acne, things like that, that maybe, you know, there's something wrong with them. And so their lower drive may be something there. And so, um, you know, it, it's important to address this um, and to talk about this from a very holistic standpoint and say, hey, you know, are you, how often are you having sex? Well, we're having sex, you know, once a week, we're trying to conceive, whatever it may be they're trying to do, but they can develop a very, you know, almost oppositional um, uh, attitude towards sexual activity, and that can lead to problems down the line. So I really think it's important to address those type of things with patients with PCOS too. Now, fertility aside, long-term health issues with this condition can be many if it's not treated properly. So obviously with high levels of sex hormones typically translate to high levels of cholesterol. And so you can see things like cardiovascular disease and heart attack risk going up in patients that have PCOS. The other thing that we see is a development of that metabolic syndrome. Um, and that's typically, you know, shown by having insulin resistance, elevated blood pressure, and what's called centripetal obesity, or fat that's deposited right around the midsection. This once again gets back to insulin because when your insulin is high, that's where you store fat. That's kind of a storage area. It's hard for you to get rid of that fat. And this can lead to this very typical, you know, kind of um, fruit-based, you know, apple shape body where you have kind of a larger midsection and then your legs and hips are kind of narrower. Um, and like I said, looking, working on that insulin resistance will cause that kind of whole body morphology to change too. Now, the other thing we have to talk about with this is that, um, you know, the high levels of circulating estradiol can lead to a condition called endometrial hyperplasia. Endometrial hyperplasia can be a pre or is a precancerous condition inside the uterus. And depending on the degree of it and the type, it has anywhere from a one to 25% chance of actually mutating into endometrial cancer. And so patients that go a very long time in between periods, especially in high estrogen environments, 
do have an increased risk for this disease. And this is why it's important to treat PCOS, even if patients are not trying to conceive. There's, there's so many more long-term kind of health things that really have to be addressed with this. So, you know, obviously this gets back to diet, this gets back to exercise, kind of reducing weight, things along those lines. Um, I will say in terms of diet, um, that the most helpful type of diet patients with PCOS can be on is what's called a low glycemic index diet. This is a diet that basically kind of changes or looks at the way food is converted into its constituent sugars. Um, foods that have a very high glycemic index or ones that are rapidly converted into sugar. This is going to be everything from your kind of generic candy bar to kind of white colored foods made out of kind of, you know, wheat flour. So things like white rice, uh, uh, tortillas, um, flour tortillas, um, you know, uh, wheat, white pasta, you know, things like that. Um, now brown rice kind of falls into this category too. Obviously foods that have a high sugar content like fruit or juice or things like that are a very high glycemic index. Um, you know, on the flip side, foods that have a low glycemic index are gonna be foods that take a long time to break down into their sugars and typically have a higher protein value as well. This is gonna be stuff like eggs, meat, um, certain vegetables, things like that. And so when you're talking about diet with PCOS, you know, whether you're talking about fertility or not, this is going to help kind of maintain that, that you know, normal levels of insulin because, you know, if you don't have it in the beginning with, you can develop it. That's the other thing to kind of consider. Um, the American Diabetic Association on their website does have a list of kind of lower glycemic index foods. You know, I typically recommend patients follow a diabetic diet with this, even though they're not diabetic. Um, because it can help, you know, reduce that likelihood of, of developing that condition. Obviously, talking with a nutritionist or a dietitian is, is a wonderful idea. I recommend that my patients who have PCOS do that as well um, to try and get, you know, that handle on things. So anyway, that's kind of our, our deep dive into polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, you know, in terms of, of diagnosis. Like I said, you don't have to even have polycystic ovaries. You just have to have oligo or anovulation, those kind of irregular periods, and signs of increased facial hair, things like that. Now, I did want to mention, and I almost forgot, high testosterone levels. You know, I, we've talked about the symptoms. What can you do about them? Well, obviously, lowering testosterone is, is great if you can do that, whether it's through that insulin stuff, you know, looking at supplements, whatever. But sometimes patients require additional therapy for that. Typically, if you're looking at just facial hair, there's a couple of different treatments. Obviously, you've got all your depilatories and electrolysis and things like that. But from a medication standpoint, medications such as aflornithine or Vaniqua can be used. That's a cream you apply to the face to help prevent facial hair growth. You can also look at a medication called spironolactone. Spironolactone has been around for a long time. It actually is a diuretic or a water pill, but it has anti-androgenic effects, and so it will lower testosterone too. The big thing with spironolactone is that you have to get it above 100 milligrams in terms of the dose to get that anti-androgenic effect, and you do have to be careful because it can cause your potassium levels to rise to a dangerous um, level. Now, certain types of birth control, um, or the progestin specifically in birth control, um, can lower testosterone. Drosperinone is probably the most well-known. That was in a medication called Yaz. Um, and it actually had an indication for you know acne and, and hormonal type things along those lines. The other thing, like I said, is just really you know t making sure that you're taking care of your skin. You know, um, acne, hormonal acne. Um, you know, if you can have a really good skincare regimen, can help reduce that. It's not going to take it away because you've got hormones to, to take care of. But remember, acne develops because you have hair follicles on the face or sweat glands that kind of can get infected um, or can get kind of clogged. So if you're making sure that you're face is really getting cleaned well, that can help reduce that. Um, the other thing, you know, body hair, once again, those kind of depilatory treatments can be used. Um, you know, um, obviously hair on the nipples or on your chest, um, you know, uh, can be obviously, you know, very uh, frustrating from a mental health standpoint. So if you have those, you know, talk to your doctor, talk to your healthcare provider about ways to remove that. I will say that in terms of elevated testosterone findings, um, pubic hair that grows on your inner thighs is actually considered a sign of elevated testosterone. So just kind of keep that in mind. So otherwise, um, that's it for PCOS. If you have any questions, give me a call. Um, I'll talk to you next week.